first African people to come to Burke County were brought here as slaves. The few early white settlers in this area between 1748 and 1763 had no slaves. But after the close of the French and Indian War in 1763, the number of settlers began to increase, and by 1771, it was estimated that the number of taxables, meaning free white males over 16, and slaves and mulattoes of either sex over age 12 was over 2,000. This implies that black people were already living here when Burke County was established in 1777. The white settlers came from Pennsylvania and Virginia down through the Shenandoah Valley, or from the older North Carolina settlements to the east. A few followed the road up from Charleston. Predominantly, Scot-Irish, German, and English people did not begin to acquire slaves until after they claimed their land and began to farm. African slaves were first brought to Virginia in 1619, so the African population was well established in America by the time Burke County was formed. The slaves who were purchased here came from the west coast of Africa, or from the West Indies, and were imported mainly through the port of Charleston. Some were new arrivals, others the descendants of American slaves of several generations. Some spoke English, others knew only their African languages. By the time of the first United States Census in 1790, they were 8,110 people in Burke County, of which 595, or 7%, were slaves. They were 1,091 heads of families who owned no slaves, 152 who owned fewer than 10 slaves, and only 12 who owned more than 10 slaves. Amy S. Rutherford, born, what is that, December 4, 1834, died September 22, 1898, lived 63 years, 9 months, 18 days. Go ahead. There's a crown up above her name with sun rays shining down above it. Go ahead. This is the memorial of Daniel Webster Rutherford, born September 5th, 19, well, 1836 died June 4th, 1896, aged 59 years, 9 months. To the memory of Cynthia, uh, who died April 21st, 1814. May have been an infant. There's only one year Mm, no day when she was born, just her death date. To the memory of Moses, died February 27, 1860, aged 63 years. He is known as the good old servant. In memory of Julius, he has a long inscription, but the stone is weathered where we can't read it. In memory of Hannah, was born November 1st, 1803. There are also other unmarked graves and footstones. This is the wall of the bigger burial site of the, we we'll assume, masters of the Rutherford. What's it called? Rutherford family in Bridgewater? 
What was the name? Rutherford Plantation. Oh, yeah. Of the Rutherford Plantation, where lies six to eight graves. All have headstones, but memories are vague. Nancy Rutherford, October 12th, 18... What's that? What is that one? Okay. Nancy Rutherford, who departed the earth October 12, 1868. You'll see the sun coming out here. I blurred it a little bit, didn't I? This is also another headstone of one of the Rutherford members. And at the bottom it says something about the person was a native of Beaufort County. There's something down there too. Was that a woman? It said at, of her. Maybe it was a female instead of a male. As you can see that the stones have been broken. This is probably the oldest grave we've come across yet. It's to the memory of... John Rutherford Sr., a native of Buford County, Virginia, born, what was that? 1755. September 5th, 1755. Died May 9th, 1841. This is also John Rutherford Maybe Jr., born October 18, 1789, died 1890, 1830. So this must have been the masters. This is another shot of the graveyard surrounded by cement wall with very large, flat tombs on top of the graves. There's about, how many graves saw you? Six. About six graves in all that we found. And we're located in Bridgewater on top of a hill behind the sawmill. Tamashan was a noble African, a prince or a son of a chief who spent a brief sojourn as a slave in Burke County. His exact nationality is not known, but he is thought to have been a member of the Falanti tribe of northern Nigeria who was captured during a tribal battle and sold to a European slave trader. He was taken to Charleston sometime before 1808, probably between 1790 and 1800. There he was purchased by William Walton, a slave trader who owned property on the Johns River brought to Burke County where he was purchased by Wachel Avery of Swan Ponds. Avery became interested in him and asked him to come to his house. Tamasham informed Avery that he was a noble race and a leader of his people and explained how he had come to be captured. Avery asked him if he could write and Tamasham promptly wrote a sentence in Arabic which when translated turned out to be a passage from the Quran. Tamashad asked Avery to permit him to return to his homeland and promised to send four men in his place. Avery agreed. Tamashad was sent to Charleston and the captain of the ship was instructed not to let him go ashore until he fulfilled the terms of his agreement. During the voyage, Tamashad warned the confidence of the captain who did allow him to go ashore alone. A short time later, Tamashan returned with a group of his people and $400 in gold dust in the amount needed to purchase four men. He stated that he could not cause others to be enslaved in return for his own freedom, so was sending the money instead. While living at Swan Ponds, Tamashan took a wife and had at least one son, Alfred, born around 1800, who became known as Big Alf. Big Alf, in return, 
had a son named Alfred, who was owned by Waitstill Avery's grandson, Clark Malton Avery of Magnolia Plantation. When he was freed at the end of the Civil War, Alfred chose a surname Fleming, and it is the descendants of Alfred and Clarissa Fleming who traced their lineage back to Tamashan. Following their freedom, most other former slaves turned to farming, which was what most of them knew best. Some had been trained in other skills, which they began to practice for a living, and eventually some began owning their own business. The 1870 Morganton Directory listed 11 carpenters, five of whom were black. By 1880, seven more black names had been added to the list. Other black men were listed as Barber, Blacksmith, Will Wright, cabinet maker, painter, shoemaker, well digger, gold miner, hackney drivers, and workers in sawmills, dairies, and tanneries. Although most women were farm wives, actively participating in the farm operations, others worked as laundress, seamstress, cook, housekeepers in hotels and in private homes. The first African American from Burke County known to have served his country in wartime was Robert Lee Poole, an Army private during the Spanish-American War. By the time of World War I, many African Americans were answering the clamor of the drums. Of the 885 men from Burke County who served in the Army and Marine Corps, 113 were black. During World War II, many Burke County African Americans again sacrificed their happiness and time with their families and, figuratively speaking, marched again to the clamor of the drums with the cry, freedom must be preserved. The war took a heavy toll on the native sons who served. Of the Burke County men who served, 118 lost their lives as a result of the direct involvement in military action or training programs. Hundreds returned with many battle wounds and scars. Four African Americans from Burke County did not return to their native soul. Killed in action were James Berry, Horatio Chambers, and Thomas Wright, for whom the Berry Chambers Wright American Legion Post is named. The fourth was Jody Berry, died at sea.